Lucy Pichara. I'm with Courier 12, which is the uh, TV and film writers club for the MFA screenwriting program here at Pepperdine. And welcome to our event with the renowned Melinda Seeger. Thank you so much for joining in the rain and coming all the way up to our campus. And we did this in conjunction with Chow. And this is Amy Lawrence. I'm Amy Lawrence, and I'm the acting president of Chow Club. So. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, it's the Cultural Italian American Organization on campus, and um, we work with students that are Italian and students that are American that are just interested in Italy. And we try and um, help bring the Italian culture to the campus and students. Thanks. And Linda, I know Paula, you have every, I'm sure you guys know everything there is to know about Linda. She's written all these books. She is the script consultant of script consultants, and so I'll just give the mic over to her. So thank you, Linda. Good. Thank you. Well, I've never spoken in an art gallery, and it's actually really fun. Um, I just said, as long as they don't light these twigs behind me and put a stake in there. And I get to look at bling over here on this one painting. And uh, I know one doesn't back up the chair very far because uh, if you told someone laying this cord, the sand is part of the arch. Do not disturb the sand. So I'm very careful and I actually think it's really fun in here. <laughs> so um, I also. This has always been a campus I've found just gorgeous. I have driven past here often. I've been on campus a few times. My niece almost went to the school. And so it's great to come and um, to see this, you know, to actually be here as opposed to just driving around here. Is this too much of an echo? Is this about the right place I should be in relationship? Okay, I'm going to talk. Um, I'm going to talk about two things, and I'm going to try to bring them together. One is um, this is my new book that came out in July. It's called Spiritual Steps on the Road to Success: Gaining the Goal Without Losing Your Soul. And uh, Paula asked me to talk about this, but to also talk about scripts. So I'm going to try to put the two together, and um, I'll, I'll just start by telling you a little bit about my background. I have a THD, that is a Doctrine of Theology in Drama and Theology, sometimes known as the least marketable degree you could ever get. <laughs> and um, I was in drama and English in college, and then I went on to drama. I got an MA for Northwestern in drama. Then I eventually went on and got an MA in religion and the arts. Then I got another MA in feminist theology. And um, if one says perhaps that was too many, but it was really fun, and I have used all the training that I have had. But um, one of the things in writing my book on spiritual steps was I reflected on my career. When I started my career, and it took a very, very long time to get going, like probably about 14 years of living on the edge and wondering what was going to happen, I had defined my relationship with God very much of just getting me through. Get me through the next day, get me through my rent, get me through um, paying the bills, uh, just get me through. And so my relationship with God was very much about the negatives, the problems in life, the struggles. It's helped me get through these struggles. And I realized that for many people, this is true. You know, if you, if you went and started to look at books about God and life, probably a great many would be about the problems that we encounter and how God helps us when we encounter those problems such as, you know, divorce, unemployment, the kids are on drugs, the, you know, um, just horrible kind of things, the tragedies of life that we continually just say, God, you have to uphold me, you have to comfort me, you have to help me. So when I started my business as a script consultant and it started to go well, I said, well, now what is my relationship with God? I mean, I, I had it all figured out when it dealt with the negatives, but what happens if things actually go well? You get your movie made, people respect and like you, you come to uh, Pepperdine and you get to speak in a beautiful art gallery and everyone says you're wonderful, is now what are the spiritual issues? And I realized that there was a whole new set 
of spiritual issues to deal with with success, not just with failure. So I, uh, it took me seven years to sell this book, to actually sell the book proposal. And um, one of the things I started looking at was not so much what people often talk about when we think of the, the steps to success, but I started to look at some of the intricacies and some of the things that um, I hadn't really seen other books talk about. So, um, and things that had happened to me, things that I could reflect on and say, oh, this was my experience. Boy, I never read about that one. I have to figure this out. So, the, um, one of the things that is true that I think is talked about a great deal and that many people sort of respond to is the idea of being called. I don't know if there's people here who feel called to your profession. Why don't I just ask, how many of you in some way or another feel called to the profession that you want to enter into or that you are in? Okay, so a number of you do. And the tricky thing about being called is whether that's a sense of I'm being guided or I am being led or I'm being pushed or shoved or nudged, or it just kind of the way opens. There's many different ways of talking about that experience. And the tricky thing about the experience is that sometimes the difficulty is you might feel called to something you're not really sure how good you are at that particular profession. And so you love it, you're passionate about it. Perhaps you're in college or graduate school and I said, I, I kind of feel called, I just don't know how good I am. Um, I was, when I started in drama, I did what a lot of people do, is I would try to get acting and um, doing some things in high school and then trying to get into the plays in college. And I was passionate about drama. I loved theater, I loved scripts, I loved everything about that. Um, but I wasn't very good. And I didn't get cast very often. I got cast, um, in the play Galileo, I was girl number two. And my line was, who is that? And when they told me the Cardinal Inquisitor, I was supposed to giggle. That was one of my big moments. Another moment was I got cast in Hecuba and I was in the chorus and I had one solo line. And this is the line. I, I defy anyone to say this line well. The line was, Surely no man could be so callous or so hard of heart that he could hear this woman's heartbroken cry and not be crushed. And the line was taken away from me. <laughs> I couldn't say it well enough. So I simply was part of the chorus in Hecuba. And there is this problem of you feel pulled into one thing and you look and say, how can I possibly do this? when I'm just not very good. And of course, I was defining drama in terms of acting, which is how you, you tend to many times when you start out. And one night I had this experience. Uh, it was in my dorm room, and I even remember how I was standing in all the corner, but I, it was like a voice. Maybe some of you hear it's like an inner voice, or it's just like words, or it's something that clicks with you, however you want to. Um, describe it. It was, you know, it's not like a big vision in my dorm room or something, but it was pretty clear. And I was asking that question, how can I commit to drama when I can't even get a role in the school play? And the voice that I heard said, your job is to keep the dream of drama alive. And I understood exactly what it was saying. I mean, it was coming through and probably what we might say is, idealistic 19-year-old terms, but what it said was, was I began to reflect on the whole nature of drama, and I thought this is the art form that combines all other art forms. There's, there's painting, there's sculpture, there's the whole three-dimensional, there's voice, there's singing, there's dance. Just about any art form you can think of in one way or another is part of what drama is. And drama is also the art form that deals the most specifically with the human condition. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a person on this earth relating and interacting with other people and with the problems of this earth? And so um, 
there was something that pulled me in is recognizing when we talk about the humanities and drama is part of the humanities, if you think about humanities, you say this is the truly humane, <laughs> human art form. And I realized that there was something under this that in illuminating the human condition, that drama also had the ability to look at how we transform, how we are redeemed, how we are transformed, how we are changed, where is the hope, where is the goodness, where is the kindness, where is the compassion. I mean, we can take all justice, we can take all the big words, all the big positive words in human life, and we can say there are plays, there are dramas, there are films that deal with these big words. And that I realized this was, somehow that was what I was about. I wasn't exactly sure how that was going to work its way out, but I began to be more clear, yes, I'm going to go into drama. Um, I, my BA was actually in English because I was at Colorado College and they didn't have a BA in drama specifically, but I had as many hours in drama and then I went on it for my master's. In, um, and I, during this period of time, I began to get more and more intrigued with looking at dramas, liturgy, and l literature, looking at the script, looking at what was going on in that blueprint that sort of laid out what was going to happen on stage or on screen. I taught drama for a couple years, uh, went on for my doctorate, and, um, and then taught drama for a couple years, but just the jobs were all sort of half-time. It was, it was exactly that time when the whole uh, market was being flooded. With every job I applied for, it seemed like there were 300 or 600 applicants. So it was very difficult um, to get a job. But in following this calling, what I found um, interesting was it started to lead me not into what was conventional, but what was actually extremely unconventional. I, my last year in college, uh, I got very interested in religion and theology. Now, I had grown up, I'm the granddaughter of a Lutheran minister, I had grown up in the church, I had always been someone, you know, you went to church every Sunday except when you were gone. <laughs> you couldn't go to church, and even then you went to church if there was a church around. So it wasn't like, don't you dare ever miss church, but it was clearly, we were churchgoers, we sang in the choir, we did duets, we did trios, we played piano, we played organ, I mean, just very much centered uh, around the church. But when I was 21, I realized that I was, um, I didn't have a really personal religion. I felt like I had adopted it from my, my parents and from my grandparents. And so I began to do my own private search and the more I got involved in it, the more I got interested in the relationship between drama and theology and how the script, um, conveys theological values and human values through the writing in the script. And so I began to do a lot more analysis of scripts. I looked at great scripts and I did my dissertation project on a play called uh, The Visit by Friedrich Dernmatt that was made into a movie in the 1950s. It's, an, uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful play, beautifully constructed. And the more I analyzed that play, the more I recognize th this is something really great. Why is this play so great? What are the elements in this play that just fit so well? How is the conflict um, working? How is the story, uh, you know, having this rising dramatic line? How are these characters dimensionalized? What are the human dilemmas that are being dealt with? And even studying theology, in terms of the play, I did a whole paper on collective guilt, um, and I did papers, I mean, I, I just did, did a whole lot of different things on this, and I also studied different theater systems. I, um, I, I looked at more, a, a theater that was more interactive with the audience, and actually when I directed the play is, um, we, we did some sort of interesting audience interaction with that. Um, but in that process, I, got, I designed this method for how to analyze a script and how to see what works 
and then later how to see what doesn't work because there are a whole lot of scripts in Hollywood that don't work and that don't sell either. And there are scripts that are made into movies that don't work and that get bad reviews and they've just wasted some many millions of dollars. So um, after so losing another job at a uh, university where they cut back the drama department, I was at the University of Laverne, and we went from six people to suddenly four of us were gone. And um, so it's like, what do you do? Well, I guess the film industry might be interested in me. All this while, feeling I was called, and the film industry couldn't have cared less about me. I was in my 30s, it was a second career. Um, I was overqualified, I had all these degrees, and well, it just, it wasn't working. I mean, I would meet with people, but they would, you know, I was a nice, sensible person, and I dressed reasonably well. Uh, I will say, Paula and Leslie are beautifully dressed today. I was looking, I said, oh, see, they are dressed better than me today, <laughs> but I dressed reasonably well, and would go to interviews and do a reasonable job at the interview. So what, um, what became to be clear, and uh, you, you know, you have this calling, and you're trying to find your way, and all the while there's this sense of, you know, you're trying to test it, you're asking people, do you really think I'm good at this? You're asking your teachers, you're learning as much as you can, you're preparing, everything seems like it should go forward if God is on your side, and you're pretty sure that God is, and there you are, it's just, it's not quite working like it should. And what I found was there was a place that one made a leap of faith, and it was across a big abyss and a big chasm. And I think the leap of faith sometimes is being able to do something in that leap that um, maybe might seem unconventional, whether it's a, a method of doing it or whether it's the kind of script that you write or whether it's the kind of movie that you decide you want to do, there's that pull that comes from the call that says, if this is true, then I might have to make a leap versus all the traditional conventional things that you think you have to do. And the difficulty with the leap of faith is that there is a fine line between a true leap of faith and sheer stupidity. <laughs> You know, if there are times you take the leap and you fall down and you crash into the chasm. And so one has, just like you test your calling, is that you might have to do a little testing of this leap of faith and to say, do I have some chance of this? Am I fairly certain of it? And I would suggest you don't necessarily mortgage your home or if you have kids, your kids' college education, making that leap, unless you're awfully, awfully sure about it. Because I have seen the sheer stupidity of that leap, and I have also seen where the leap works. Now, one of the things I found about the leap, and I think it's the same about calling, I do not believe we do things alone. And not just in terms of our spiritual relationship. I think that we do things in relationship with other people. And um, I had a sense when I first started out that you're, you know, the whole idea of the self-made person, the Lone Ranger, till I realized that Lone Ranger had a companion. <laughs> and I thought, wait a minute, even the Lone Ranger didn't do it alone. And so there is this, there, um, that there was a sense you're supposed to know it all and then you can sort of figure it out and you can very logically follow through that. Now I will say, it is important to know a lot. And I think sometimes there is a tendency to say, if God is on my side, I don't have to really write a great script. That you do have to write a great script and <laughs> because you have to do your part. And so part of this thing about being calling and going forward to the leap is to say, have I really done my part here? Have I? learned what I have to learn, have I, if, if, if I'm a screenwriter, have I really studied about screenwriting, have I watched a lot of movies, have I um, taken advice from other people, I mean, have I really done a lot of work on that, or if you're a director, whatever that area is. But then there comes this sense where I don't think, I don't think anyone in the film industry really has done it alone. In fact, I'm not so sure anyone in any industry has done it alone. 
when I was starting out, I heard a woman speak about that she had to start out as a secretary and she worked herself up through the ranks and she says, you just have to do that. And then she says, in about six months, I became, maybe it was the director of development and it's going on and I thought, boy, if she could do it, I guess we can. And someone leaned over and said, her father is the president of the studio. <laughs> yes, he had her to be a secretary for six months <laughs> to get a little bit of experience, but he says, just, you know, see through this little speech here. But what I think happens is there are people lucky enough, lucky enough, perhaps blessed enough to have mentors and that have people who can go to bat for you, who can get somebody on the line and say, Stephen, uh, I have a great student here. Would you see him? And you go in and you do meet Stephen. And then he says, um, yeah, you're just great and your teacher speaks so highly of you. And I just happened today to have an opening <laughs> of some sort or another. And you think, yes, that's really great. But most of us do not have that. And so for most of us is that spiritual struggle and that spiritual step, which is also <laughs> the professional struggle, is really a lot of, of saying, okay, do I go right or left today? You know, or do I go straight ahead? And how do I make sure that if I go to a meeting, I have done my job so that perhaps something can happen here? And for those of us who didn't have mentors or who didn't have the professor that would go to bat for us, one of the things I learned was, so I find my own mentor. And I, if I have to hire my mentor, such as hiring somebody to help me, I will do that. Now, um, I had a brilliant, brilliant career consultant. I didn't find her right away. I had some people who were not so brilliant that put me on wild goose chases and took a lot of money, and I did not have any extra money. But I was determined that if the way to get ahead, if the way to make somebody's work work was you have to have a team and you have to have relationships around you, then if I don't have that, I'm going to have to form my team. And um, I decided that I had to stop thinking of myself as the Lone Ranger and that I had to figure out what did I need to make things work for me. Now, the first thing, I felt that I had the right thing in terms of I had this ability to analyze scripts, but the job of script consultant did not exist. So I made it up and I didn't know if anyone would come to me, so I priced my services really, really low. And I realized that I was doing what I really loved to do. It was an extremely well-suited job for me to, to analyze scripts, to work with writers. I had a lot of skills in psychology and diplomacy. I was an extremely diplomatic script consultant. But I realized I, could, I didn't know a lot about marketing. I didn't know a lot about business. So I found a script consultant. Uh, I found a career consultant. It just happened that she wrote scripts. And so we did trades, and we, and actually, we are still trading, and it is 25 years later. Um, we have traded through our whole lives, and she's now writing a book, and I said, well, you know, you just come to me when you need me to do reading or anything, because she, you know, and we didn't do hour by hour. We just, when the other person needed the other person, we were there. And that, with her help, and then I, I went to a, um, I went to person on sales. I just was scared to death of selling and having to make a cold phone call or saying to somebody, I want to talk to you about sales or talk to you about my business. And so I went to a woman who was an expert on sales and I remember she was $75 an hour and this was in the early 80s. And I said, I can't afford $75 a month, but I can afford $37.50. And she says, okay, we'll do half an hour. And I went every month for 30 minutes for four months. And she said, if you can spend an hour with me, I will triple your income in, I think she said five months. It was either three or five months. And she did it. And I said, okay. And I remember I was $100 under the tripling of the income. And so I started investing in my team. I went to a closed consultant for when I did 
certain kinds of seminars. I went to a media consultant. I went to a speech consultant for seminars. And I had already been a teacher, but I said, okay, I want to see are there some other things that I should be doing. And any time I needed help, I scraped together those pennies and I said, These are, this is my team. And at the same time, I found I also needed to ground myself and what my vision was be, and what my calling was. Because what I found was there are many people who will get you off your vision. And there, and, and there are many people who want to join up with you because they don't have a vision, <laughs> and you do, and you think they have nothing to offer you. It's not that they're nice people and you can certainly go out and have coffee with them and be supportive, but you do not have to go into business with them. And so um, what I discovered was that there were these kind of minefields that were there and you had to keep holding. It was keep holding to the vision while you are making judgments and having your team help you make those judgments. And one of the things was I, I found in changing my thinking model, I changed my thinking model to what is called the linear competitive hierarchical, sometimes patriarchal, model of doing business. The person is on the top who has all the authority and all the power and we try to rub elbows with them and then there's the little peons that are down here. I changed my model from the linear model to what I call the web model. And the web model of thinking is a connecting relationship model. And uh, if you imagine a spider web, there's a center to it, and there are these, you know, spokes and everything that come through um, and connect everyone. But the web, like the spider web, which is also the world wide web of, of connecting links, the web is a combination of the, the line as connection, not separation and not hierarchy, of the circle as being inclusive and embracing and of teamwork, of the spiral, which is a symbol and a metaphor for transformation with moving upwards, and then the web that puts it all together. And instead of seeing other people as my competitors, I saw them as my collaborators. And it, it took some time to learn to do this, but I said, I do not think that if um, you look at a career, I, I do not think this linear model works. I also began to suspect it was not a very spiritual model because it pits us against each other rather than has us working together. And I thought, if you think of film as a collaborative art form, that the collaboration works because the writer and the director and the producer and everyone is respecting each other, they are working together, everyone has learned their jobs well and they are contributing that and you hope you get ego out of the way. And so the relational model says, I think of my team and I think of how to support other people because the more people there are out there doing great scripts and doing great films, the better it is for the world. I'm not out just for myself, I'm out for the world. And Leslie was saying about when Tom was here, right? Um, is it Shad? Yeah, yeah, I always have a little trouble with his last name, but he was saying, you know, my, my goal is to change the world. And I'm like, of course, yes. And you, you change the world by making the world better and by expanding the idea of what your goal is. So that instead of the goal is, I want to write a script that sells, is, well, I want to write a really great script that speaks to people in the audience, that communicates, that perhaps inspires, that gives them insight, that does something wonderful with them. And I am not in competition over that script, is that if it's a really great script, then there's going to be people open to, to that script we hope, <laughs> and that one is going to go through this process and say, I don't, I, I'm not trying to sell my script by keeping someone else from not selling their script. So one of the things that in this journey, in these spiritual steps, I find is that you expand the vision in your mission statement so that it is inclusive rather than exclusive. And that I figure anybody who is trying to help make better films, they are on my side. 
and I'm on their side. And I don't care if it's, you know, some other seminar teacher where they say, well, they got more people coming to their speech than mine. So it doesn't matter. Because what matters is we're all working toward the same goal. And if somebody, you know, has a book that comes out, they say, boy, they got great reviews, Linda. I wonder if they're selling more than you are. As you say, it doesn't matter. Because as long as they're writing a good book that helps make great films, they're on my side and I'm on theirs. And, um, and in doing this, one of the things on these spiritual steps that I learned was that in, well, let me go back to success a little bit, that what I discovered was that in, um, in success, there is this tendency to be competitive. There is this tendency to think there's only one goal at the top of the ladder and you have to get it. And there is also this tendency, of course, um, I might say to have opinions on your colleagues. And there are colleagues who are either not very nice people or who do annoying, disgusting things. But early on, what I, I, I made a couple different decisions. One decision I made was I would never speak badly about a colleague in public because people would love to know what I think. And anyone who becomes a public figure, that is, becomes sort of well-known in your field, people will want to know what you think of other people because that is their gossip for the day. And the thing is, you don't tell them. Now, so I think it's really important to just make that as a policy, is to say there is nobody that I dislike. If somebody dislikes me, they can dislike me, but I am going to really try not to give them any reason. And so, you know, you do have people who will make up things. There's something on the website, um, actually on Amazon.com, a review of my book where somebody says, well, Linda wrote her couple first books, and then she went out and she got a PhD in New Age philosophy. And it was, and I mean, there was like a little dig there, I thought, it's not coming from me, and my, my PhD is not in New Age philosophy, and, you know, it's too bad this person feels they have to do this kind of stuff. But there will be people, but the thing is, don't give them the excuse. And so one tries to keep their behavior exemplary and to the best of one's ability, which is not perfect. And the other thing is in saying, I will not speak badly of anyone in public. Notice I said in public. Now, here's the problem with that, is if you take it too far, you really believe that you truly love everybody in the world and that nobody truly bothers you or annoys you or their behavior makes you a little angry. So what I did was, I said, that's not realistic. Because the truth is that there are some people I like not as much as some other people that I really, really like. And so I have two friends who are the soul of discretion. And when I have to be honest and realistic about someone or something, I call them and I say, Pamela, I have to vent. And I said, I even have to be a little catty today. And she says, meow. <laughs> I says, do tell, my dear. Now, I know that whatever I tell Pamela about my reality is not going to go further, but at least I'm honest about my reality. So I have a place where when I need to be really honest about my feelings and to vent, I have places to go to keep me realistic and to keep me from any thoughts of my perfection, of all my emotional and intellectual life, because it isn't perfect. But in public, I say that the public space is not a space to say negative things. And I think um, that has turned out to be really a good thing. Another part of this, I think, is that in moving forward on that path, on those spiritual uh, steps on the path, that sometimes there we are our own worst enemy. And it's been interesting to me that the, some of the people where I have seen this, trying to get a script sold, you know, they write a script, they try to get it sold, and um, they are, you know, really doing everything they can. It's interesting to me how many of these people are Christian. <laughs> and I just look and say, it's hard for me to believe that the stupidity along the path is being done by you would, 
you would hope people who have a spiritual community to help put them in check and that they would be doing a lot of pray prayers to put them in check. And I have seen um, some of the most stupid behavior done by Christians and sometimes I thought, why? We're supposed to be a little more enlightened or insightful or something. But I think that sometimes what happens is that strong belief in our calling can really make us think that we have done all of our part to make the calling and, and to make things happen. And some of these people that I watch as I thought, you're not getting good advice. You don't know what you're doing. You're egocentric about this. You think that because you took one class in screenwriting and took a weekend seminar that you know everything there is to know about screenwriting and that your script is absolutely perfect and fabulous. And so what you see sometimes is that we as Christians have a form of egocentrism that is slightly different than the ordinary kind of egocentrism because we think that God is on the side of our ego, not theirs. And so there is, um, there is a whole lot of separating out of where this, you know, where this line is. And uh, another part of the separation is that I have a chapter in this called, book called Willing to be Blessed. I have seen people push away the blessings. And you, would, you want to say, are you nuts? That was a blessing. Well, it didn't pay me enough money. Well, yeah, but it was, you were going to get your movie made. You are going to get your script done. So what? Well, I really wanted a million dollars for the script. I'm sure it's worth it. And I say, oh, <laughs> you were just being blessed and you kicked it out of the way. And now here's again the little, uh, the little naughty problem is that there is a fine line between blessing and temptation. <laughs> just like there's a fine line between the leap of faith and stupidity. And that sometimes what looks like a blessing is actually a temptation to go down the wrong path. On the other hand, sometimes what you think is a temptation is actually a blessing and you better take it because um, there is a lot to be said for God giving us blessings and when we do well with the blessing, many times we get more blessings. And when we do well with more blessings, we get more and we get more. So that the idea is to try to stay very true to not only the blessing coming to us, but there are a lot of verses in the Bible about the importance of what you bless will be blessed by God and of giving blessings back. And there is, and that gets back to the circular way of thinking that it is around, this is how life works, not this kind of straight direction. And this is also how creativity works, that we do not go in straight lines. We go around and we pick up pieces and all of a sudden Eureka got it, aha. And so, so um, we learn something about looking at a looking at a blessing and I, I think one of the things that a blessing does is it ripples outward. It keeps going. Um, I've been maybe some of you've read that book, The Prayer of Jabez, and it's in oh is it Leviticus? It's it's one of those books in the Bible we don't read as often as the other books. But it, there was a book about this. And the prayer of Jabez is, you know, oh God that you would bless me and expand my territories. And um, one of the things, how many of you have seen that book? Have some of you seen, it's a lovely book. Well, one of the things that I thought of it, I said, expand my territories. I think, what an interesting image. Sometimes it's translated to enlarge my coast. That's probably very good here in Malibu. But just think of that as to expand my opportunities and to expand the ripple effect of my work that it ripples out and that it keeps doing good things in the world and that it does not, or as we say, does not come back to me void, that when it goes around, it keeps doing good things. And I got to thinking about that prayer, not just in terms of to expand my territories and said, well, I guess for me, that means that I get to come to Pepperdine <laughs> and I get to go to Germany and I get to go into different places and talk about um, scripts, talk about screenwriting, talk, you know, about, in this case, talk a little bit more about the new book. And, but I also began to think of the idea of prosperity that is so often 
defined as, you know, oh, that I would prosper, that I would have more money and a really nice car. And you think, wait a minute, prosperity is about things blooming. And so when you, if you pray that prayer of, oh God, that you would bless me and expand my territories, and I've been adding, and prosper me, and I don't mean just money, although that's nice, uh, but that it is not just about that, is to say to prosper me that the things that happen bloom and grow, and they keep going out there. And one of the things I often have is if you remove money from the equation, what does the choice look like? And in many times, that's what one of the things you do, is to say, I just remove money from this equation because I want to make a clear, clean choice. And one of the things I say is, God has plenty of money. And he can give me some that if I make a choice that doesn't give me as much money, I can get maybe more money over here in order to live. So that there is a sense about trying not to get into that sense of prosperity and blessings being about more money or more things, more materialistic things, but more about getting my work to go out there. Again, that doesn't mean stu being stupid because sometimes stupidity has to do with I'll just do everything for free because I'm such a good person with such good will and say, well, no. <laughs> you know, there is a thing about valuing your contribution too, but there is, this, there is this thing about saying, what is really, what is it I'm really after? What is my calling really about? What is that vision really about? And generally it is not about money and it is not about fame and it's not about ego as you remove all those things from the equation and you get much clearer about what it is about this path you're going down. I've also gotten intrigued that on the path to success, that most of the time, um, that almost every single job you can think of has people who are doing well in it and people are failing. So people say, I want to become a lawyer because I'll make lots of money. And say, I know lawyers that aren't making much at all. Well, I'll become a doctor because I'll make lots of money. Oh, I know lots of doctors that are not doing well. Well, I'll become a writer because they make lots of money. And say, well, sometimes they do and a lot of times they don't. And so anything that you look at, you can find somebody who is doing extremely well at that job and you can find people that can fail at that job so that sometimes it is not the definition of the job, like being the producer, being any of this, it's really how well do you do the job? And what are you, and, or sometimes they say, what are you bringing to the party? And that is something that I've thought a lot about. I, one of my books, I interviewed Leonard Nimoy for, for my script, from script to screen, went to his home, which is near the Bel Air Hotel, and it's quite lovely. There was a beautiful fire going, and he had very good coffee. And, but one of the things that Leonard Nimoy said that really stuck with me is he says, you always ask, what do I bring to the party? What am I bringing as myself to whatever it is I do? Not only my knowledge, but me as a person, my own insights, my own um, ways of looking at life, my own subject matter for a script, my own sense of character. What do I bring and to, you know, to the script or to the movie or whatever it is that you are doing? And it makes you realize a lot of times what you bring to the party is it not, it not only is it different than what other people are bringing, but it is special and it is needed. And it may not look exactly like what other people are bringing to the party, but you hope you have, <laughs> you hope you have something to bring to the party. Now, one of the things on, um, if we went to 11 and then had questions, is that a good way of doing it? One of, um, one of the things on the road to success I did find out was you meet the seven deadly sins. And you will meet all seven of them. Some of them will have more power over you than others. Some of them, like sloth, for instance, my friends say, Linda, sloth would be really good for you. <laughs> And I did look at that and I said, well, sloth is not exactly relaxation, but relaxation would be very good for me. But there are some where you say, that is not my problem, and maybe you will have a slight encounter with that. Because sometimes people say, well, sloth is sort of just getting by, or sloth is not caring a whole lot about something. And so that can be sloth. You say, okay, I've had a little bit of that, but not nearly as much as others. And 
that on the road to success, one of the things about these sins is that we've, you know, we've heard about all of them. There's, there's pride, anger, greed, gluttony, sloth, usually anger, lust. I think those are the seven. And um, one of the things along this road is that you come across them in that if you were to read about these, many times you would read about the antidotes. For instance, people say, well, the antidote for pride is humility. But I think in business it's different. I think the antidote to pride is relating to other people because pride puts yourself at the very top of the ladder and it says, I am above it all and I am just wonderful and everyone please bow down to me. And if you want to get over that, the best thing to do is to start supporting your colleagues and being supportive. And that means looking at what they're trying to do, looking at what their goals are, helping them in any way that you can, having the insight to look carefully at another person and say, now that person is really good at such and such. And that is not my strength. And so when somebody calls, like if somebody calls me, to script consult and they say, I have a really, really strong mythological theme. I generally will say, I'll tell you who you should go to is Pamela J. Smith. She's the mythologist. She's the expert in this area and she's just terrific. And so many times I won't take that job. I mean, unless they say, well, I called Pamela and I didn't like her, but nobody ever says that because everyone likes Pamela. <laughs> so, so, but many times you listen and you think i'm not the best person to do that job now the reason why you can let that job go is because you are a collaborator and because you trust god to say i feel like that i am not the right person for this so i do not need to really hold on to it so tightly because you know what there is a job i bet where there is the right i am the right person now, what do you think happens with Pamela when she gets a call and says, Linda recommended you? Pamela adores me. <laughs> when someone calls Pamela or when someone says, well, what do you know about Linda? You can be pretty sure. Pamela's going to say really nice things about me. So now you start having a circle going on and you get off the pride place because you are back into relationship again. Um, I, I recognized about the stupidity of pride. When I was, late 1980s, I started doing seminars abroad and I thought I was the cat's meow. They actually were gonna fly me business class to New Zealand to work and they were going to pay me. And they were gonna put me up at a really nice place and they were gonna take really good care of me and I must be pretty, pretty great because only the most terrific people get that. So my husband says, um, as I am leaving to get on the plane to get into business class, <laughs> that my husband wishes me a safe trip. And I says, don't worry, honey, nobody ever dies in business class. <laughs> and I sit down in seat 7B. Six weeks later, that United flight that was going to Hawaii had a hole blown in business class and it sucked out like four people, seven people, and one of the ones was seat 7B. And when I read that, I had this little shiver like, how stupid are you? <laughs> and I said, that is, that is one, close to one of the stupidest things I have done and said in my life, close. And I said, okay, because there is this sense with some of these sins is that you really think you're invulnerable. You, and what happens is that there is a place in one's success journey where you really are so well protected. You've got your secretaries who love you, you've got your fans, you've got your work, everything's going well, and you, are, you actually can build a bubble around your life where it seems that nothing negative can come through. You got enough money for a therapist if you need one. You got the nice car. If anything goes wrong with the car, you have enough money to get it fixed. You have the nice house. You have all these things around you, and so you have this little bubble. And you suddenly realize that the things of life can't get through to you. 
that the, the things that are really part of life, the unpredictables that you can't control, maybe even the muddy things that are part of life, and you have gone, you've just protected yourself. And so when I reached that point, I said, there's something wrong here. This is not the best way to do life, to be that protected. So I did two things to get out of my bubble. The first thing I did was I went on a cattle drive. <laughs> it was shortly after City Slickers. And when you are on a cattle drive, you sleep outside, and then it is just you and the cows, 600 cows, and your horse, and there's somebody cooking for you, and whatever clothes you can sort of, I mean, you don't really bring a lot of stuff. And you're out there in nature, and the main thing is keeping the cows moving forward. That's all you really have to worry about. And you know what? When you're riding with someone and the cow gets in the thicket, and you're riding your horse over to get the cow out, and the other guy is helping you, they really don't care how many books you wrote or how much money you made. And when they would say, what would you do? Is, you know, I say, well, I'm an author. And they say, well, I'm a truck driver. And you know what you realize? like. They don't care, and, and I've never met a truck driver. So, oh, I've never met a truck driver. And you find that the truck driver was one of the nicest people, and he was great with cows. And I loved riding with him, because every time the cows went in the thicket, I'd look over at him, and we were off, because we were really good at moving those cows. So that was, the, that was one of um, the first things I did, in just saying, I have to burst the bubble by literally doing some things in life where I am not real good at it, I wasn't great at cows, I wasn't even great at horseback riding, but where I'm not real good at it, but that it is getting me into a different world where I am now more vulnerable. The second thing I did was I got involved in a charity. And I am on the board of directors of a charity in the Philippines, and I went over there, and I've, I've been over there twice. And it's a charity that deals with education, with oppressed women, and with farming. And um, one of the things, I helped them buy this farm that they actually have as a, as a nine acre farm, which is starting to produce trees and has animals on it, and it's just gorgeous. And when they bought it, there was very little. And after I'd been there, the, the nun who runs this says, Linda, we need you to buy us a farm. <laughs> I said, oh, <laughs> I'm thinking. And so, um, and she says, yeah, he says, actually, the, the farms in the Philippines are cheaper than the farms here. It's $8,500. And I said, well, I, I could give you some money. So one day I'm, um, I'm in my office, and I'm saying, God, wouldn't it be nice if I could do this? But I don't know, 8500 I mean, you know, I'm not going to take it out of retirement because I'm self-employed. And this little voice, you know, that voice that had, when I was 19, was in that corner. This voice was in that corner. And this voice reminded me that when I had worked in Switzerland six years before, I had put my money in a Swiss bank account because the wire transfers were not as easy. And that little voice says, Linda, you have a Swiss bank account. It's not being used for anything. You could just give that money to the Philippines. And so I called, Phil I called Switzerland. I said, how easy is it to transfer to the Philippines? They said, no problem at all. So for a while, the farm was named after me. It was called the Linda Sager Eco Stary Farm. But then someone else contributed more money. So now a field. <laughs> I have a field named after me. And I said, what's growing in that field? Because <laughs> there's a big sign, the Linda Sager Field. And they said, nuts. <laughs> So if anyone had excessive pride at that point, there was a nut field named after me in the Philippines. So um, one of the things just in this book that I do is I explore a lot of these different issues and, um, and how what I have seen. And then I interviewed a lot of Christians in different walks of life and in different denominations. And I talked about these particular problems with them in these issues, and so I got kind of other people commenting on how these issues relate to them. But I've just mentioned, you know, a few of them. Um, anyway, I know so we're probably at a good time to do questions, and then I can take off with questions in any direction you want.
Or I'll figure out something else to talk about. There's no questions, yes. Uh, the nature of Hollywood has obviously changed significantly. Um, my money used to be spent on development is not being spent. Um, yes. Perhaps my money used to be spent on consultants. Yes. <laughs> it's no longer being spent. Um, what do you foresee you know, for young screenwriters just getting in? Where is this need headed? Well, someone was talking about that because they said the studios are just doing everything really, really traditional, but it still leaves room for the independents. And I think what might happen is that when the independents start having some hits that the studios are not having because the studios are being too conventional, that um, that is going to, that would probably change. It's only going to take one big hit for someone to say, "I missed that script because it was an unknown writer." I think the other thing is the world is opening up in a really big way. And there gets to be this, it's almost like an egocentric Hollywood thing about, um, you know, I have to write for Hollywood and say there's a whole lot of other markets besides Hollywood. And in the early years in film, there were people making films in every state, you know. Now is it's not that hard to be in touch with somebody overseas. So I had last weekend, I had a five-day script consulting mini, mini class. That is, I had uh, two people, and one was from Germany. And she said, if you have any clients who have scripts that would work in Europe, and whether it's co-productions or whether it's just, you know, in Europe, she says, I know a lot of the producers and the studios and the people, investors in Europe, and send them my way. And I've gotten clients, jobs. One of my clients, I um, was working with a producer from Paris. He needed someone to do a rewrite. And my client, uh, and it was his first, well, he had written, he'd written a script, and so this was really his, like, he, but his script, his work was so good. And so I recommended him, and they flew him over to Geneva, Switzerland to sit in a castle for six weeks and work on the script with the producer. And then they took him to Paris, and they paid him also. And so you realize um, that some of this thing about the studios and the concern is thinking, you know what, probably the first time writer may not be getting in the studios anyway. The studios are just defining what they've probably been doing all along. And so it's like, well, that's probably not my market anyway. And, and, and also, as you know, when you do a great, when you do a great short film that gets noticed, is they begin to notice you. And same thing with agents, any of these people. They tell me that they keep their eyes on who's winning the screenwriting contest, who's, who's winning at various film festivals around the world. And they said, we know who those people are, and we go after them. So um, I think it's, it's just part of saying, you know what, I don't have to follow the same path. And I do have to find my path, but I may not have to follow the same path. I mean, everyone told me when I, when I decided I would be a, a script consultant, they said, well, no one has ever paid for that. Certainly not with someone who's not known, who has not written an Academy Award winning script. No one's going to go to you. No one's going to pay you. There is no way this business would ever work. Yeah. Well, I think I'll go talk to somebody else because I don't need to hear that. Let me go talk to some other people. And pretty soon it says, now wait a minute, there is a need out here. And it's the same thing your scripts. There is a need for your kind of scripts. But do make sure that they are really good um, before you start shopping them around because you only get one chance. And some other questions. Yes? The uh -huh. uh, loved it. Um, and I just wanted to know what your current take was on um, adaptations that have done really well in the market. You know, obviously, um, in an adaptation. And if there was anything that you felt um, you might add to, to the book, like maybe a second edition or something that talks about the book. Yeah, well, I'd really like to update that book. I just finished doing a new edition of Making a Good Script Great, which will be out next year. So I'm in the final editing 
process that is, I finish my work, the editor has just sent, has sent back his work, and I am now going through all his edits, so probably the editing will be done in another week. Um, I have actually thought of going back and updating all those early books, like adaptation, because there's a lot of interesting things to look at, and I've worked on more adaptations now than when I wrote that book, and um, it is an interesting, you know, it, it's an interesting process, and I'd probably talk more about some of the adaptations and some of the things we run into. Uh, some of them that have been made, like for instance, I was the script consultant on that on Luther that came out about four or five years ago with Joseph Fiennes, and it was Peter Ustinov's last film. And um, the whole idea of what happens when you do true life stories, and the person, you know, things are, <laughs> oh, thank you, and things are. Um, the person doesn't live their life in the right dramatic order. <laughs> and so you say, hey, you were supposed to meet Katrina at the end of the act one, and you didn't meet her till act three. And you say, well, that's just how it is. Now what are we gonna do about it? And, in, and many times in adaptations, you are pulling out every technique you've ever learned in your life to make the thing work. But I have worked on some really fascinating adaptations recently, and you know, they're not going to be in movies quite yet, but I have a, th I have a feeling that at least one, if not both of them, are f will probably be made. And I thought another, a good time to do that adaptation book would be after those are done, to, you know, do some analysis. Um, but the, the thing is also is that these books take a whole lot of research, so when I think, oh my gosh, going back and doing all these interviews for creating unfavorable characters, and the studios keep changing what you're allowed to quote. See, in my first book is I had to pay about $100 to quote from Back to the Future, and most of the other stuff was free. In my latest book, in the best screenplay goes to where I quote from Crash and Shakespeare in Love and Sideways, they originally wanted $2,000, <laughs> I said I could do that. I got them down to $250 a script, and um, because I did two different uh, scripts from Shakespeare in Love, was I had to pay $250 for each of those. Well, now, so I mean, still that's you know that's a fair amount of money. It's not like these books make a whole lot. You might think they do, but they don't. But um, then when I did the new edition of Making a Good Script Great, they said, oh, now we're doing it all differently now and we're charging more. And so the kind of quoting I did in my last screenwriting book, I can't do anymore. So I went back and I got permission from the writer and producer, The Sting, to use that as a classic rather than African Queen. And then I did very short quotes from other things and tried to keep them uh, what I hope is under fair usage. But although some people say there is no such thing as fair usage, but. You know, I'm, I'm hoping no one's going to sue me because I quoted 20 words. You know, that's what they quote in reviews and other things. So, um, so, so it gets, you know, it, it gets real tricky. But I would like to update that book. But I'm hoping these other two adaptations actually go, and then I would have something to talk about that was really, really new. <laughs> so, other yes. Um, as you consult, what do you find the most common? Well, it used to be the most common critique was structure, that they didn't have a three-act structure, they didn't have a clear turning point, the turning points were at the midpoint. I mean, it was a real muddle and it was not focused. There has been 20 years of a number of us talking about structure, and so structure is getting better. What I'm finding now is that the development, that the kind of beat-by-beat beat movement forward in the script, that that sometimes is just not very interesting, um, or sometimes you, there, there are always the problems of being derivative, of somebody copying the last hit. But I would say I've gotten more interest in the development, I've done more writing now in the transformational arc and how that develops, um, interesting relationships, the other thing that has gotten me really very interested in the last maybe 10 years has been the whole idea of what I call a good character. And I don't mean dimensional, I mean good. Not evil, good. And I think people for many years have thought good characters were not very interesting. 
May I use the word Atticus Finch here? <laughs> and you do think, now wait a minute, that's not true. Uh, one of my favorite characters is Carol and as good as it gets. She is a nice person. She is a good person. She is a kind person. She, is, she has got terrific qualities to her. And I think, oh my gosh, she's terrific, and she won an Academy Award, you know, for that role. I think um, Sam Girard in The Fugitive has been one of my favorite. He's a good guy. And when he comes out of that one-armed man's house, he said, this guy is dirty. He knows evil when he sees that. I mean, he knows there's something wrong. He might not know exactly what it is, but he knows. And so, um, there's a lot of interesting things to explore, and I think there's been a tendency, and this happens sometimes, that there's a tendency when people say, well, the three-act structure or the craft of screenwriting, that's just a lot of rules and it's paint by numbers and all that. And you say, no, it's not. It has loads of room for innovation. Look at Crash. Almost every one of those subplots has a three-act structure, and there are there are brilliant second, there's a brilliant second turning point. It goes bam, 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 and you feel this rush into the third act. And every one of those subplots is hitting a crisis point. Now, Paul Haggis, when I talked to him, he's, you know, he, he didn't think incredibly structurally, but this guy has been a structuralist for years and years and years. He's been writing a long, long time. And actually, for those of you who have read Making a Good Script Great, you know, the case study was Witness. I decided instead of doing a case study of a movie, I did a case study of a writer. And I asked Paul Haggis if he'd be my case study, and he said, yes, right away. And I didn't have to spend three months writing innumerable emails to people who turned me down. I said, oh, it is so nice when something goes easy, <laughs> when you get the first yes, as opposed to having to go through a really, really long period of time to find it. And I had interviewed him for Crash, and, and the, the best screenplay goes to, so he was receptive. You know, he knew who I was. And, but it was just great to have him say yes. And, it's, um, and the focus of that interview is really about writing and the process he go, he's gone through and about selling and what his career has been like as well. And since, I mean, he's just a huge writer, you know, right now, hopefully for a long time to come. So it, was, it seemed to work well. Okay. Other questions? We have a few more minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, do you have any general advice for unsold, unproduced writers who are as quickly as possible trying to make this their career? Well, I think, I think one thing is you will probably have to write a number of scripts to have calling cards in order to get an agent or in order to get notice and enter them in, in film festivals and screenwriting festivals to, and to, to you know, keep working on them. I would say join a writer's group. And, and join a good writer's group, not the one that reads your script and say, oh, I just don't know what to say. It's so ill-conceived. It just doesn't work. And then when you say, what should I do? Well, they say, oh, I couldn't begin to tell you. You don't need that. That when you, whether it's a consultant or a writer's group, go to these groups that are positive and constructive and have good leaders or good people in them that know that is not how you critique a script. You do not have to get demoralized in order to get a, a better, you know, a better script. And there is some evidence that people who are part of writers groups actually sell faster. And that evidence is also a lot of novelists and you know other writers are part of writers groups. And they said there knows again you're on a web. You're on a web of support with other people when you're in a writers group and take classes and learn everything that you can. Be a sponge because one of the things is, there's a saying, you can't use it if you don't know it. So you have to learn it in order to be able to use it and everything you learn about people and about scripts and about drama and about anything like this, you keep integrating it into your work. And that means taking classes and and be a little careful of what I call guruism. There used to be the, the whole discussion of who was the greatest screenwriting guru of them all. And, you know, and he said, oh, well, I... <laughs> and and uh, 
don't get into that. And don't let any of us get into that because you need to take classes from a lot of different people. And you take what works for you and you, you, know, you integrate it into your work. But, um, so there's a, there's a lot of people have a lot to offer. Yes? I love the trend that you're seeing in the scripts that are being picked up. I know you mentioned Crash and some really powerful scripts that are getting recognition, but obviously there's a lot of Hollywood blockbusters that maybe don't feel or, like, as um, powerful in their scripts, and so I want to know your opinion on that. You mean about scripts that... Like what, are, what do you see as the trends of the scripts that are really getting picked up, and do you see, I mean, it really just depends, I know some, like you said, some powerful movies are being recognized a lot. Whether you prefer don't pick um, At the moment, I don't really see a trend right now. Usually, what happens is when we start getting in um, the Academy Award movies, which will start, you know, people that think their movies will be nominated, um, which will start very soon. I think then we start seeing what is taking off both critically and commercially. Now, I think it's interesting that the movie, for instance, Hurt Locker, which I, I wish would be nominated, I don't know if it will, but I think it's great, you know, directed by a woman and um, who's been around a long time, and um, just some very interesting exploration. And I, I haven't been really on top of what's coming up. I, I, I have some thoughts about who might be nominated for actors, for instance. I think Julie and Julia, I, I think Meryl Streep will probably be nominated again, but um, I'm not as sure about what's coming out. I haven't kept as much on top of what's ready to come out. So, so we probably have time for one more question, maybe? Is there another question? Or not? Yes. Anyone else? Going, going. <laughs> so I brought along, I, I couldn't get a lot of books in my suitcase, but I bought along four books. They're $15 each. And, uh, and I have business cards up here. And I have a website. I actually have a couple of websites. I have a website for the book as well as my own lindasager.com website. So thank you.